Hello students, and welcome back to another lecture for CORE 201. So today, we are going to talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, who was a very interesting woman, who unfortunately was living during a time when women weren't supposed to be particularly interesting. So she, these days, is considered one of the original feminists, even though that word wouldn't be invented until almost a century after her death. But while she was living, she considered herself a writer and a philosopher. Uh, she did a lot of things that she was able to do, but she was also kept from a lot of things that she wanted to do. So first, let's talk about what she did during her life. So Mary Wollstonecraft was raised to be a gentlewoman. And she did her best. She had the jobs that were available to gentlewomen at the time. Uh, she was a governess for a little while, and she was a paid companion for a little while. She even opened a school for a little while. But that was sort of during the first part of her adult life. During the middle part of her adult life, she got a little more adventurous. Uh, she started traveling. She went to France during the French Revolution, where she definitely met and hung out with Thomas Paine. So that's the first instance, I think, of the authors that we've read this semester hanging out with each other. Uh, she wrote some travel books. She did all sorts of interesting things, including writing this piece called A Vindication on the Rights of Men, which she wrote before A Vindication on the Rights of Women. So during her own life, she was a pretty well-respected writer and a reasonably well-respected philosopher, but she also had some scandal. Uh, so while she was alive, she had two extramarital affairs. She had one child out of wedlock. She got pregnant for the second time out of wedlock, but she did end up marrying that guy. His name was Samuel Goodwin. After her death, he published her memoirs, which I've always had a bit of a problem with because they were scandalous. Uh, she talked about her affairs, she talked about her mental health, she talked about her suicide attempts, and all of that was sort of forbidden for people at the time, especially for women at the time. So once he published her memoirs, basically her reputation was in trash. Um, it was almost a century until people started talking about her again and started reading her published works again. So during her life, she was reasonably well respected. For a long time after her life, she was considered much too scandalous to be taken seriously. And then finally, at the end, we take her seriously again. It's also worth noting that she died shortly after the birth of her second child from complications of childbirth, which was reasonably common at the time. But her second daughter was Mary Shelley, who grew up to write Frankenstein and basically invent science fiction. So it's a very literary family, but a lot of personal drama. So while Wollstonecraft was writing this, and while she was working on her other first piece as well, basically the French Revolution was happening around her. She was actually in France for a lot of it, which was a very daring thing for a woman at the time because it was dangerous there. But I wanted to point this out because again, I think it's important to think about what's happening historically while these pieces are being written. So you probably know about the French Revolution already. It's one of our most famous ones. The catchphrase, of course, liberté, égalité, fraternité, which basically means liberty, equality, brotherhood. So during this period in time, people were really starting to focus on these enlightenment ideals, these ideals about individualism, about liberty, about the right to govern oneself, about the right to not have a monarch. So her ideas about the liberty of women and the individual aspects of individual women were kind of in line with what was going on at the time, but they were also really shocking and really new, and she was one of the first people to, like, officially write them down. So her book is called, of course, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She had to talk about the rights of women because they weren't considered very important at the time. So even though we've been reading all of these pieces about how all men are created equal and all men deserve liberty and freedom, it's still men asterisk. Right? So for her, she's introducing this idea that perhaps all women are also created equal, and perhaps all women are rational humans who can make decisions. Which these days, we believe, generally, uh, but in those days was kind of a brand new thought, and definitely not one that people were ready to get behind. So when this book came out, she did publish it anonymously, although later she did take credit for it, of course, even during her own lifetime. But it was a pretty big hit when it came out. A lot of people read it, and a lot of people got very mad about it. But it has experienced a kind of resurgence um, in the years after her death, especially in the early 1900s, and then again in the 1970s. So this is sort of one of the like original feminist texts, even though, of course, she didn't say anything like that at the time. So I also wanted to tell you a little bit about women's conditions at the time. 
So I mentioned earlier that Wollstonecraft was raised as a gentlewoman. And this was pretty common in her specific class and in her specific period of time in England. Basically, women were raised to have a little bit of education. They certainly could read and write. They knew a lot about the fine arts. But basically, a woman's education was focused on her becoming a mother and a wife. So a lot of what they were taught was designed to sort of attract husbands and then to be able to run a household. They certainly were not expected to know anything about like politics or business. They weren't expected to be sexual in any way. They really weren't expected to be independent in any way. Basically, you lived in your father's house until you moved to your husband's house. So I want to be very clear that even though some of this will sound familiar because it will, um, at the same time, what she was struggling with was a different world. So for her to have these ideas about independence and about sexuality and about like the rational behavior of women was kind of unprecedented. And that's why this piece still remains so popular. So now we get into chapter two, the prevailing opinion of a sexual character discussed, which is a pretty great title. And one thing that I want to make clear again before we get started is that when she says sex, she means essentially what we think of today as gender. So very often in modern sociology, especially, we say sex as the sort of biological implications and gender as the more social stuff. So sex has to do with like your chromosomes and your genitals and gender has to do with like the clothes that you wear and the things that you do socially and that sort of thing. So for the purposes of sticking to the text, we'll just keep saying sex and sexism. All right. So the point of this chapter is to sort of address the way that women are being treated in the world in which she lives. So this is a pretty good summation quote right here. To account for and excuse the tyranny of man, many ingenious arguments have been brought forward. So essentially, she's arguing that instead of having a king as a tyrant, we have basically men as tyrants. And so what she's gonna do for the rest of this chapter is essentially try to explain the way that women are being treated and especially the way that that is unfair. So let's get started. One of the first things that she starts to deal with is the way that women's intelligence is treated and the way that it's kind of assumed that they're just not as smart as men. Women are not allowed to have sufficient strength of mind to acquire what really deserves the name of virtue. So part of what was going on in this period of time was a sort of infantilizing of women. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that they knew from autopsies that women's brains were a little bit smaller than men's brains. And this is true. On average, women's brains are 10% smaller, but also women are often 10% smaller. Uh, and it turns out size of brain has nothing to do with capability of brain. But in this time period, they did think that because women's brains were smaller, women's intelligence was also smaller or women's capacity for reason was also smaller. So one of the things that Wollstonecraft is arguing is that treating women like they don't have a sufficient strength of mind to deal with virtue or business or anything else was a big part of the issue. So she goes on to sort of talk about this willful ignorance. Behold, I should answer the natural effect of ignorance. The mind will ever be unstable that has only prejudices to rest on. So essentially her argument here is, yes, of course, the women seem mentally unstable to you because you haven't taught them anything. You haven't asked anything of them. All you've given them is this sort of prejudice that they are dumb and weak and fragile and small. And so that's why they seem to you to be dumb and weak and fragile and small. So essentially, if you keep these blinders on the women, if you, if you keep them ignorant, then what you will find is that they seem quite ignorant to you. Seems pretty simple. This one is one of my favorite paragraphs because it's uncomfortably modern. Women are told from their infancy and taught by the example of their mothers that a little knowledge of human weakness, justly termed cunning, softness of temper, outward obedience, and a scrupulous attention to a puerile kind of propriety will obtain for them the protection of man. And should they be beautiful, everything else is needless for at least 20 years of their life. So. Essentially what she's saying is that we teach women from the time that they're very young that they only need to learn a few things to get along. Um, one of them is just to be soft, to have soft temper, outward obedience, um, propriety. And if you're, if you're lucky, you could be a little bit clever in such a way that you could control the men around you. But the good news is, if you're pretty, you don't even have to worry about that. You can just coast on being pretty. So essentially her argument is that we have trained women to believe that this is the only thing that matters. And even if you're pretty, none of this matters at all. 
So again, it sounds pretty old fashioned, but also weirdly modern. So now she continues with this argument that the education of women is one of the big problems. That essentially treating women as children all their lives turns them into dysfunctional adults. Men indeed appear to me to act in a very unphilosophical manner when they try to secure the good conduct of women by attempting to keep them always in a state of childhood. So this sort of like denigration of women, this way of acting like they are immature and they are incapable of the kind of maturity that turns them into like responsible, virtuous adults, she argues this is the problem, is trying to constantly keep them in a state of childhood. So what should we do instead, you ask? She says we should educate women in a totally different manner. That in fact, we should educate them to enable the individual to attain such habits of virtue as will render it independent. So this should sound familiar because here we are with Aristotle again. She's saying that if you want people to be virtuous, you have to train them to be virtuous, right? You have to enable them to have habits of virtue. You have to like put this in place and then allow them to become humans who practice virtue by habituation. So just the same way that we allow men to achieve virtue by habituation, so too must we allow women to do the same thing. Because if we just keep treating them like children, they will end up like boring children. The question then becomes, okay, but why don't we do that anyway? Like, why haven't we been doing that the whole time? And she says, all the writers who have written on the subject of female education and manners, from Rousseau to Dr. Gregory, have contributed to render women more artificial, weak characters than they would otherwise have been, and consequently, more useless members of society. So basically she's saying the reason we don't educate women this way is because we've been told by the leading minds at the time, including Rousseau, who we'll read next semester, that women can't. They've been depicting women as weak, um, as kind of dumb, as children, and because the leading minds of the time have been doing this, they have produced this very specific result. This makes sense, right? We have a cause and effect thing happening here. So next, she deals with this idea that maybe it's not the job of the husbands to help women mature, that maybe we can't lean on the like male life partners that are assigned to these women. But alas, Husbands, as well as their helpmates, are often only overgrown children. Nay, thanks to early debauchery, scarcely men in their outward form. And if the blind lead the blind, one need not come from heaven to tell us the consequences. So she's saying that the husbands can't help the wives mature because the husbands are themselves basically children. Uh, that they have also not necessarily been raised to be like mature, independent adults. Especially, she's about to get really mad at like the wealthy husbands, especially the ones who weren't asked to be mature themselves because they always had people helping or telling them what to do. So essentially she's saying that we raised women to be dumb and their husbands aren't helping either because their husbands are also overgrown children. So next she starts dealing with this idea of what we do train women to do. But in the education of women, the cultivation of understanding is always subordinate to the acquirement of some corporeal accomplishment. So essentially she's saying we do educate women, but we only train them to do kind of useless things, uh, to play the pianoforte, to embroider, to dance. We don't train them in like virtue or philosophy or anything that might help them become more capable adults. This, she argues, creates something that might not be desirable. Strengthen the female mind by enlarging it, and there will be an end to blind obedience. So essentially she's saying, if you don't want these boring, useless women around, then you have to strengthen their minds. But as blind obedience is ever sought for by power, tyrants and sensualists are in the right when they endeavor to keep women in the dark because the former only want slaves and the latter a plaything. So again, she's dealing with this idea that you did this to yourselves. Uh, that the women that you have surrounding you are boring and stupid because you didn't teach them anything else. But she's digging into a slightly deeper level here, which is basically maybe you didn't want them to be intelligent. Maybe you only wanted blind obedience. Maybe you created this system on purpose. So she says that essentially the tyrants want slaves and the sensualists want a plaything. So perhaps the men have raised the women to be 
useless and pretty because that's what they want to surround them in their own house. Kind of dark, but she might be right here. The next point gets really interesting. She's like, okay, well here you made all of these dumb pretty women, now what? The woman who has only been taught to please will soon find that her charms are oblique sunbeams and that they cannot have much effect on her husband's heart when they are seen every day. So essentially, she's like, all right, now you got all these dumb, pretty women. Now what? And this is true. You're going to get bored. I imagine you've seen some version of this meme. Basically, the idea that just because someone is pretty does not mean you want to hang out with them all the time. Uh, just being pretty is not the same thing as being an interesting adult or a good wife or a nice partner. Like, raising a bunch of people to be stupid and pretty will be fun for a day, but in 10 years, you're going to be so bored so bored. So her solution to this, to raise women to be partners, to be life partners, to be useful adult humans. The woman who strengthens her body and exercises her mind will, by managing her family and practicing various virtues, become the friend and not the humble dependent of her husband. So basically she's saying, if you want a life partner, if you really want to have the same woman next to you, for the next 50 years, what you're really ultimately going to want is a friend. It's not some, you know, pretty little plaything. You're going to want a friend and a partner. And she says the best way to achieve this is to strengthen your mind and also to strengthen your body. It was very unfashionable for women to exercise at the time. As you can imagine, exercising in a corset, not ideal. Um, and she was one of the people that said, hey, what if women were physically healthy too? Uh, what if they went for walks outside instead of just like staying inside and sewing all day? which again was revolutionary at the time. So here she's saying, if you strengthen your mind and strengthen your body, ultimately you're gonna end up a more interesting person and a better partner. Wollstonecraft goes on to point out that we've actually seen this historically before. In fact, if we revert to history, we shall find that the women who have distinguished themselves have neither been the most beautiful nor the most gentle of their sex. And this is true. Again, you've probably seen this bumper sticker somewhere. Basically, she's saying that if we look at interesting historical figures, if we look at Cleopatra, if we look at Joan of Arc, that maybe we'll notice that they weren't beautiful and they weren't gentle, and in fact, they were intelligent and sometimes even physically quite fit. So she's saying, I have evidence of the fact that exercising and strengthening your mind is good, and here it is, it's historical. So the last part of this chapter does get a little repetitive, but I think it's funny, so I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. Uh, basically, she's revisiting the idea that if you raise women to be dumb, they'll turn out dumb. For though moralists have agreed that the tenor of life seems to prove that man is prepared by various circumstances for a future state, they constantly concur in advising woman only to prepare for the present. So essentially, she's talking about how women were raised to be wives. So your whole education up to your marriage was designed to like help you train to attract a husband and then your whole education after your marriage was designed to help you raise babies but that was it those were the only responsibilities for women so you were only ever prepared for like what was going to happen to you tomorrow and not for like how to be an individual in the future this one is essentially what she's talking about how we train women Gentleness, docility, and a spaniel-like affection are, on this ground, consistently recommended as the cardinal virtues of the sex. Um, and again, I just think this is so funny, a spaniel-like devotion, uh, which this picture, I think, illustrates what she's talking about there. So she's saying the only thing that we really teach women, especially in regard to relationships, is gentleness, docility, and affection. So basically, we raise women to have this virtue and this virtue only. None of the other virtues Aristotle talked about, none of the virtues that you want to see in like a life partner, only this. And that means that essentially you have trained them to be helpless. But avoiding, as I have hitherto done, any direct comparison of the two sexes collectively, or frankly acknowledging the inferiority of women according to the present appearance of things, I shall only insist that men have increased that inferiority till women are almost sunk below the standard of rational creatures. So here she's saying, look, I'm not even going to get into this thing, this biological difference between men and women. I'm going to get into the social difference. She's saying, I'm going to address the way that men have essentially sunk women below the standard of rational creatures. 
And again, in her time period, this was so true. It was so true. Um, you could argue that it is still true, right? Like we do still treat girls way differently than we treat boys. But her argument is that if you have noticed that the women around you seem kind of silly and dumb, maybe this is why. Her final argument in this chapter is that basically she's not gonna bow down to some man. She might bow down to an intelligent argument, but not just to some man. I love man as my fellow, but his scepter, real or usurped, extends not to me. Unless the reason of an individual demands my homage, and even then, the submission is to reason and not to man. So she's saying that his scepter, which is, this is a scepter, it's like that stick that a king carries with the thing on top, uh, that his scepter is not the thing that she bows down to. That if somebody makes a really intelligent and reasonable argument, she'll absolutely acknowledge it, pay it homage, but she's not going to bow down to them solely because they are a man. She will only bow down if they have a really good, reasonable argument. So basically, chapter two is arguing, we raise women to be dumb. When women turn out dumb, we should not be surprised. And that instead, we should give them a more logical, reasonable ex education if we want them to turn out to be useful life partners. A pretty good argument. The next chapter that we read has a really marvelous title. Of the pernicious effects which arise from the unnatural distinctions established in society. We never use the word pernicious anymore. Um, so again, she's getting into this argument that the way that we raise women has an effect, cause, effect. First, she wants to deal with this idea that we don't see women as moral creatures. And she's saying that, well, Maybe that's because of how we raise them. There must be more equality established in society, or morality will never gain ground. And this virtuous equality will not rest firmly, even when founded on a rock, if one half of mankind be chained to its bottom by fate. So she's saying that if you want a moral society, which was a big deal at the time, then you have to allow women to have a certain amount of equality. Because if you, uh, you know, metaphorically chain them to the bottom, they're never going to be able to rise to the top. So if you continue to, you know, hold women down, hold their education down, treat them as stupid, they will never be able to achieve the kind of virtue that you're looking for. This is a pretty good argument. Again, same a little bit as the last chapter, but she's going somewhere with this. Unfortunately, she does not immediately go somewhere with this. We take a little detour into how much she hates rich people. I don't know. So part of her argument is that the society in which she's living, and again, this is very like Victorian, um, the wealthiest people are also the most useless. Again, sometimes this sounds familiar, but she kind of digresses for a little while into some arguments about how the people that she sees like running around, being wealthy, uneducated, wasting much of money are the worst members of society. So she takes a break to sort of be mad. First, she talks about this idea that raising children with wealth can lead to bad, lazy, rich kids. Hereditary property sophisticates the mind and the unfortunate victims to it, if I may so express myself, swathed from their birth, seldom exert the locomotive faculty of body and mind. So she's saying that being uh, swathed in richness often means that you turn out lazy. And thus, viewing everything through one medium, and that a false one, they are unable to discern in what true merit and happiness consist. So she's saying essentially that their wealth blinds them, that they're raised in a kind of cocoon in which they're not able to see real virtue. So on the one hand, this is not a bad argument. Very often, if we do raise people in a kind of cocoon of wealth, they're not aware of what's going on in the rest of the world, and it can become hard for them to become empathetic and to achieve virtue that way. But it's also that sort of thing where not wealthy people are mad at wealthy people. Uh, Wollstonecraft was herself pretty poor for most of her life, so in a way she was also mad at people for being rich, especially people that she felt were squandering their wealth by being lazy and immoral. She talks about next how even if you're not raised with money, at least for men, they have options to make money. Destructive, however, as riches and inherited honors are to the human character, women are more debased and cramped, if possible, by them than men, because men may still, in some degree, 
unfold their faculties by becoming soldiers or statesmen. And this is true. If you were born a poor woman, your odds for social climbing were very low. Very, very low. Probably you went into either a life of service or you married someone of your own station and just stayed poor. But if you were a man, you did have the option of social climbing because you could join the army and rise up that way, um, or you could join politics and rise up that way. So even if you were born poor as a man, you could still like achieve something, but as a woman, the odds were very low unless you, know, you had some sort of Cinderella situation. Next, she talks about how if you are a woman, especially a woman born into a lower class, really your only option is to be super sneaky. Women are, in common with men, rendered weak and luxurious by the relaxing pleasures which wealth procures. So again, she's sort of mad at the lazy, wealthy women. But added to this, they are made slaves to their persons and must render them alluring that men may lend them his reason to guide their tottering steps aright. So here she's kind of dealing with two things, that being raised wealthy can make you lazy, but also that if you are raised wealthy, your primary goal, your primary job is to be pretty and that is itself extremely limiting. So she's saying if you are slaves to your persons, if you have to render yourself alluring, basically you have to spend a lot of time on your outfits and your hair and your makeup and your like dainty personality, uh, that you will ultimately be kind of useless and you're going to need some man to like <laughs> hold you up when your steps are tottering because you're you know walking on heels. Or should they be ambitious? They must govern their tyrants by sinister tricks, for without rights, there cannot be any incumbent duties. So, if you are born wealthy, but you're also clever, and you're a woman, your only real option is to sort of control some man behind the scenes. That you have to be sort of like the puppet master, and again, we've seen this, like in literature or in movies, maybe in your real life. The really smart woman controlling her slightly dumb husband. This is, you know, not something that was recently invented. So she's saying, again, ultimately, if you are raised a wealthy woman, you can either lean on some man to make all your decisions, or you can control some man from behind the scenes. But either way, those are basically your only two options. Her final argument in this section about how wealth makes people bad is that the people who have this wealth should use it to enable other people to improve. And she's kind of mad that they're not. Though I consider that women in the common walks of life are called to fulfill the duties of wives and mothers by religion and reason, I cannot help lamenting that women of a superior caste have not a road open by which they can pursue a more extensive plan of usefulness and independence. So here she's basically saying, yeah, I get it that women who are poor or middle class basically have to spend all day raising their children because that's what religion and common sense said that they only have time to do. But what about the wealthy women who could hire someone else to raise their children or run their house? Why don't they pursue something else? Why don't they pursue education, pursue reason, pursue independence? So essentially she's saying, I get why women in my station are too busy to essentially improve themselves and improve the faculty of their mind. But what about the really wealthy women? Why don't they step up and do something? Also an interesting argument. One of the things that we hear a lot today is that if you are in a position of power, you need to lend a hand to bring somebody else into the room. So this idea that she's having here of why don't the wealthy women step it up since they have the time and resources is also not a new one, but an important one. So now Wollstonecraft continues to talk about gender. She's back to her you know, original set of ideas, but here she's gonna to start to offer some solutions. So first, she wants to deal with a couple of things. And one is the expectations that we right now have for women. So the first thing that she wants to deal with is this idea that the only thing that we ask of women is that they be visually appealing. Men are not aware of the misery they cause and the vicious weakness they cherish by only inciting women to render themselves pleasing. So she's saying that basically, if the only thing that we ask of women is that they be beautiful or that they be pleasant, we're really kind of trapping them in a cage and we're really creating these kind of useless partners. And she says, if we don't want just a bunch of women who focus all of their time on being beautiful, maybe we should ask for something else. And she references this couple that she saw recently that she thought were interestingly equal and, and useful to one another. I have thought that a couple of this description 
equally necessary and independent of each other, because each fulfilled the respective duties of their station, possessed all that life could give. So she's saying that essentially, if instead of having men up here and women down here, we lived in a more equal way, perhaps that would be better. The women would be more helpful. The partnership would exist instead of just being one person helping the other person all the time. So she's starting to sort of lay out an argument for how we might improve society, starting with an argument for how we might improve personal relationships. Next, she starts to deal with the legal aspect. So she talks about how we should design society one way, but instead we kind of designed it another way. A truly benevolent legislator always endeavors to make the interest of each individual to be virtuous. And this should sound familiar, right? Aristotle talked about this, Aquinas talked about this. Basically the idea that if your laws are virtuous, your citizens will be virtuous because they will follow those laws. Again, of course she's read Aristotle. And thus, private virtue becoming the cement of public happiness, an orderly whole is consolidated by the tendency of all the parts toward a common center. So this is, again, more of that argument, that if your laws are virtuous, your people will be virtuous. But the private or public virtue of women is very problematical. For Rousseau and a numerous list of male writers insist that she should all her life be subject to a severe restraint that of propriety. So she's saying that we could have equal laws for equal people, that we could all be treated equally under the same laws and thereby achieve virtue. But instead, we put this extra burden on women, this burden of propriety, this limitation of having to behave all of the time a certain way. So you may have heard this metaphor before of the gilded cage, and that's kind of what she's talking about here. This idea that even though your life might be very comfortable, your cage might be full of cushions and very shiny, that doesn't mean that you're able to achieve adulthood. Like it's still a cage. So even though it's a nice cage, still a cage. And this is kind of how she's making this comparison. That even though the women are being taken care of and they have a lot of cushions or whatever, they're still being held down. This is still a severe restraint that we're putting on women that we're not putting on men. And this is an important argument because at the time, again, we were making a lot of noise about all people being equal under the law, but we weren't really including women in this. So her argument is, we need to if we want them to be interesting adults. So she finishes with this idea of the forced limitations. Why subject her to propriety, blind propriety, if she be capable of acting from a nobler string, if she be an heir of immortality? And this is a really beautiful sentence, I think. Like, why hold these women down if they're capable of so much more? If they, just like the men around them, are heirs of immortality? Is sugar always to be preceded by vital blood? Is one half of the human species, like the poor African slaves, to be subject to prejudices that brutalize them when principles would be a surer guard only to sweeten the cup of man? So again, she's saying, is it worth keeping half of the population in this stupid gilded cage just to make men a little tiny bit more powerful? And she also brings in the condition of slavery. She was notoriously anti-slavery. And this is something that, again, we're only starting to deal with in the culture at the time and in our syllabus now, right? She's saying the same way that we're sort of holding women down, we are also holding down all of the African slaves. And wouldn't society be better if instead we raised them up and treated them like adult rational humans? Again, a shocking argument at the time. So she's saying essentially, what if we just treated women like equals? So next, Wollstonecraft launches into some really crazy ideas. What if, she says, we had representation for women? She even knows she's going to get laughed at for this. I may excite laughter by dropping a hint, which I mean to pursue some future time, for I really think that women ought to have representatives instead of being arbitrarily governed without having any direct share allowed to them in the deliberations of government. What if women had a say in government? You know, no taxation without representation? Same sort of thought. <laughs> 
Right now, she's arguing women are being arbitrarily governed without anyone asking them or allowing them to have a share in the deliberations. So again, this was a really radical idea and people did laugh at her. They also laughed at this next idea. But as the whole system of representation is now in this country, only a convenient handle for despotism, they need not complain for they are as well represented as a numerous class of hardworking mechanics who pay for the support of royalty when they can scarcely stop their children's mouths with bread. So not only are women not represented, neither is the working class and they're still paying taxes. How are they represented? Whose very sweat supports the splendid stud of an heir apparent or varnishes the chariot of some female favorite who looks down on shame. Again, she's real mad at rich people. Taxes on the very necessaries of life enable an endless tribe of idle princes and princesses to pass with stupid pomp before a gaping group who almost worship the very parade which costs them so dear. So angry. But again, she's saying, yes, of course, women want representation, but also what about all of the people who pay taxes? Maybe it's a dumb system for only the wealthy people to make the rules and to levy the taxes when the majority of people are poor and half of them are women. Again, seems pretty rational to us in this century, but in her century, that was some crazy shit. So next, she goes on with even weirder ideas. What if women had jobs? So next, Wollstonecraft launches into this idea that maybe women could contribute to society. But what have women to do in society, I may be asked, but to loiter with easy grace? Surely you would not condemn them to all suckle fools and chronicle small beer, no. So she's beginning this argument, like what can women contribute to society? She's saying a lot of stuff. They don't just have to raise babies and be nurses and to chronicle small beer means to like keep the household accounts. She's like, maybe they could do other things. Her first suggestion, maybe they could be physicians. Women might certainly study the art of healing and be physicians as well as nurses. And to be clear, historically women have been mostly in charge of healing, especially in charge of birth, which is the thing that she starts to address next. In midwifery, decency seems to allot to them, although I am afraid the word midwife in our dictionaries will soon give place to accoucheur, and one proof of the former delicacy of the sex be effaced from the language. So at this point in history, it was still traditional for women to deliver babies. Historically, women always have. Men did not enter the literal room uh, until pretty much in the 1800s. And then by the 1900s, it was standard to have a male doctor. And that's when birth practices changed and everything went downhill. It's a whole thing, that's not this class. But she's saying, you know, women have historically been healers. Why don't we just let them be healers again? Why don't we just let them continue to be the ones who deliver babies? It's been recently invented by the French, a male midwife, that's what that word means. And she's like, what if instead of allowing men to like enter into a previously female occupation, we just kept it female? That would be a nice way for women to contribute. She has an even weirder idea. What if we let women study politics? They might also study politics and settle their benevolence on the broadest basis. For the reading of history will scarcely be more useful than the perusal of romances, if read as mere biography, if the characters of the times, the political improvements, the arts, etc., be not observed. So she's saying, yeah, women can read and they can read historical books, but what if we taught them all the other stuff? What if instead of acting like these are just characters in novels, we explained the social factors, the historical factors, the political factors that made these people important? So what if instead of just reading a biography like it was a story, we read a biography like it explained a point in time and a person's usefulness and their gifts at a point in time? What if we allowed women to become more intelligent and to become more useful members of society by teaching them? Amazing. Her next idea is even crazier. What if we just allowed women to run businesses? 
businesses of various kinds they might likewise pursue if they were educated in a more orderly manner, which might save many from common and legal prostitution, which is true. Pretty much the only business available to women at the time was prostitution. So you could either essentially be, you know, a teacher or a nurse or a prostitute. So if you wanted to be a business owner, it was brothel or nothing. So she's saying, what if instead we just educated women? What if we allowed them, like these women, to go to Harvard Business School? These were the first women who ever went, as you can see from that picture. It was in the 60s. Uh, so what if instead of trapping them at home or trapping them in the brothel, we let them run other kinds of businesses? Maybe that would be useful. She then goes on to remind them that this might be good for business because there are so many women. Is not a government then very defective and unmindful of the happiness of one half of its members that does not provide for honest, independent women by encouraging them to fill respectable stations? So she's saying, if women are indeed half of the population, isn't a government that doesn't encourage them to go into business kind of irresponsible? Again, I think this is a great argument. If you want women to fill respectable businesses instead of brothels, then you need to allow them to fill respectable businesses. So she's saying maybe the government needs to kind of reframe its job and allow for women to rise up through the ranks, to be educated, to own businesses, and to actually contribute. Mind-blowing. As evidence of the idea that this might work, she kind of laments the way that it's currently not working and how sad it is that we're not letting women do these kinds of things. How many women thus waste life away, the prey of discontent, who might have practiced as physicians, regulated a farm, managed a shop, and stood erect, supported by their own industry, instead of hanging their heads, surcharged with the dew of sensibility that consumes the beauty to which it first gave luster. So she's arguing how many women are just sort of moping around or being useless or being pretty and useless when in fact they could have done something that would be helpful and they could have stood on their own two feet and not depended on men. Part of her argument is if you're tired of supporting all the women in your life, maybe you should let them support themselves. It would be a solution. Then she argues that what we truly value might need to change. How much more respectable is the woman who earns her own bread by fulfilling any duty than the most accomplished beauty? So again, she's leaning on this argument that we value beauty, but maybe we shouldn't. Maybe that shouldn't be our whole focus. Maybe a woman who can achieve something, who can earn her own money, earn her own bread, is in fact more accomplished than a woman who is very beautiful. And here is Wollstonecraft's final thought, a really gorgeous summation, I think, of her ideas in the book. Would men but generously snap our chains and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience, they would find us more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers, in a word, better citizens. We should learn then to love them with true affection because we should learn to respect ourselves. So she's saying, if you really want good partners, good citizens, good mothers, you need to allow the women to be rational humans who can respect themselves and respect you. These are such good arguments. And as you can tell, we did, for the most part, take this seriously. We do educate women now. We do allow women to own businesses. We do allow women to have representation in the government. So even though her ideas seemed outright laughable at the time, they turned out to be pretty reasonable and they turned out to be a way that we were able to create a better society for everyone, not just half of people, but all of people, because ultimately the ripple effects impact everybody. So I'm looking forward to talking about Mary Wollstonecraft with you and hearing if you think this is perhaps a little bit too modern or if we're way past that. So I'll see you soon.